All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is John Donadio with the New Jersey Association of Counties. I want to again welcome you to this video workshop on the NJ Pact uh, Real Rules. We're very pleased to have with us today some officials from Cape May County who are going to provide a, a, a comprehensive overview of, of the real rules, in addition to some solutions on how the legislature, community stakeholders, and others should be involved in maybe taking a more reasonable and measured approach to addressing climate change and sea level rise. Before we get started, and I turn it over to our, our, our panelists, just a couple of housekeeping things. If you have a, a question throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A button, not the chat button. The chat button we're going to use if we need to communicate with each other, and we will do our best to answer your questions throughout the event. I also, as always, want to thank Angela Wolf, who does a terrific job of managing all the IT and video conferencing stuff for us. So thank you, Angela. We appreciate it a great deal. Uh, and with that, I am pleased to introduce our folks from Cape May County who have done a fantastic job of educating county officials and municipal officials across the state on the potential impact of these real rules. And I would encourage you uh, to visit their website. It's just a tremendous resource that I've spent a lot of time over the past couple of weeks on, as have other counties and, and municipalities throughout the state. So with that, I am pleased to introduce in the bottom left square, starting with Commis Commissioner Andrew Bolkowski. How are you, sir? Great, great to see you. Thank you for being here. Good morning, John. Bob Thank you for having me. Sorry. No, no, not, not at all. Bob Commissioner Bobby Barr. Good to see you as John. well. Pleasure to be with you and everyone else. Thank you for having us today. It's our, it's our pleasure and always good to see both you two gentlemen, as it is uh, Ron Simone, who is the Cape May County Assistant County Commissioner and really, uh, you know, been spearheading Cape May County's uh, efforts be, behind the scenes. So thank you, Ron, for all your hard work on this issue. Thank you, John. Appreciate your time and effort. And then we have Peter Lomax, who is president of Lomax Consulting Group and really did a, a wonderful job, Peter, if you don't mind me saying, on, on a report commissioned by Cape May County on the impact that the real world will have. So thank you for being here today. We appreciate it. Morning, John. Thank you for the opportunity. And then last, but certainly not least, the uh, learned county council, Jeff, Jeff Lindsay, he was also here today. So Jeff, it's always good to see you and, and thank you. Thank you as well for being here. Thank you. You as well. Good morning, everyone. So with that, I'm going to shut off my video and turn it over to uh to Cape May County. Okay. Good morning everyone and thank you for taking the time to participate in this call today. On behalf of the Cape May County Board of Directors, specifically uh Director Len Desiderio, Vice Director Andrew Bolikowski and the rest of us, I would like to thank the New Jersey Association of Counties for the opportunity to present today on the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection's proposed NJ Pact real rules, and specifically their impacts on municipalities and all counties throughout the state of New Jersey. First and foremost, I would like to state that we at the Cape May County Board of Commissioners are not cl climate deniers. We understand and recognize that climate change is real and sea level sea level will continue to rise. <clears throat> we have already we we in Cape May County already have some of the highest some of the highest flood, base flood elevation and resiliency practices in place with some of our municipal municipalities in Cape May County already having some of the most stringent protection rules and standards not only in the state but in some cases nationwide thanks to the CRS program. With that said, NJ PAC's proposed real rules are current, the way they are currently written, raise real concerns as it relates to ADA access, affordable housing, economic impact, and environmental justice. For those reasons, Kinley County and every one of our municipalities and several other counties and municipalities throughout throughout the state of New Jersey are calling on the state to consider a more gradual approach to <clears throat> implementation, and this includes the following. Pursuing a comprehensive and independent economic analysis, including a focus on protecting 
the interests of ha ha low and moderate income families, engaging all stakeholders, including the New Jersey legislature. Consider a more gradual approach based on a 20 to 30 year time frame, rather than 75 years into the future, based on a five foot sea level rise at the probability of less than 17%. A state budgetary <clears throat> appropriation to assist with enforcement and, and driving project rules to implement the rules. And finally, hold public engagement sessions throughout the state and local communities that support that supports these suggestions and other, making sure that all voices are heard. As a wheelchair-bound man living in Ocean City's coastal zone of Ocean City, New Jersey, these proposed new rules scare me as it relates to ADA access. This is a concern that is echoed by several by several disability organizations that I am affiliated with. Our concerns are real, and answers need to be reached before, before we jump off a cliff. In closing, again, I want to reemphasize, climate change is real, and sea level rise are real threats to our way of life and need to be addressed. But, not, but how we address those threats should be comprehensive, thoughtful, and with careful stakeholder engagement working with real people most affected by these rules. I want to thank you all for participating today, and I'd like to introduce our Deputy Administrator, Ron Simone. Or no, Peter Lomax of the Lomax Consulting Group. I apologize. Thank you so much, Bobby. I'm going to uh, share our screen. We have uh, Peter's presentation here um, today. He's going to go dive into the technical aspects of the so, and without further ado, Peter. John, I just want to make sure that uh, you can see the, the screen. Uh, yes, sir. It looks great. Thank you. Okay, great. Perfect. So, again, thank you for the opportunity to visit with you this morning and, and speak on the, the NJDEP rule proposal. Uh, just a short very short background on myself. I'm a graduate of Rutgers University with a degree in environmental planning. Uh, it feels like a lifetime ago. For the last 30 years, um, I've been navigating New Jersey land use law in five levels of government, um, one of the most complex land use regulatory climates in the United States. And um, uh, this proposed rule is, uh, is an amendment to many of the existing rules that, uh, that the state already has in place. Just as a quick housekeeping uh, message, um, I would just advise the group today that the information that's being presented has been sourced in the rule proposal or in existing NJDEP rules. Uh, in addition, um, many of the graphics that you'll see are sourced directly from NJDEP presentations uh, and the mapping that uh, we'll be presenting comes directly from NJDEP GIS shape files, um, which are all in the public domain. So with that as a, as, as a preamble, I'll jump into uh, just a quick overview and then get into the technical component of these rules, just really focusing on two principal areas. Um, one is the inundation risk zone, and the second is the climate adjusted flood elevation. In 1,044 pages of rules, you might imagine that there are more changes than just these two, and you would be correct. There are significant updates um, across a number of different regulatory programs at the state that are reflected in the rule proposal. But in the interest of the time that we have available today and for the focus point of this discussion, I'm going to concentrate on, on just the inundation risk zone and the climate-adjusted flood elevations. These rules come out of an executive order from Governor Murphy's uh, administration uh, for the Protection Against Climate Threats, abbreviated in, in acronym PACT, and with a mandate to DEP to adopt uh, new rules using the best available predictive climate science 
and uh, to focus on state policy objectives to address sea level rise, extreme weather intensification, and chronic flooding. As I mentioned, these, uh, this rule proposal will update a number of rules, including the Coastal Zone Management Rules, the Freshwater Wetlands Protection Act Rules, the Flood Hazard Area Control Act Rules, and the Stormwater Management Rules. Um, the last three of those rules are statewide. They cover the entirety of the state. The Coastal Zone Management Rules, obviously, uh, that's directed uh, in the CAFRA zone from uh, Sandy Hook down to Cape May and up the Delaware Bay shore uh, to Salem City. Uh, but the coastal zone rules also impact the rest of the state uh, as well along uh, waterways through upland waterfront development. Uh, the timeline that uh, is specific, we can just move on to slide number two. Uh, the timeline, uh, we're in the midst currently of a public comment period, which began on August 5th with the rule proposal. Um, it was originally intended to end on November 3rd. Um, it has been extended, but only by four days to November 7th. Public comment period began um, initially with three public hearings. One was in person, two were virtual, and the balance of the public comment period uh, seeks written comments, as you can see on the screen. Uh, the uh, rule, as I said, or the public comment period will end on November 7th after which DEP will go through the process of addressing public comments um, and considering uh, any changes that may occur to the rule at that time. Uh, what DEP has stated is they expect a summer uh, of 2025 implementation of this rule, um, and that would occur, must occur, within one year of its initial proposal date of August 5th. The scope of this rulemaking is fairly substantial in that it addresses not just uh, new development, but also redevelopment. And within the redevelopment category, also the renovation or rehabilitation of existing structures where substantial improvements to the building are met. And that substantial improvement is a defined metric where the renovation costs exceed 50% of the market value of the structure itself. Not the property as a whole, but the structure. There are two very important uh, numbers that are used in these rules that uh, come from this chart. One is the year 2100, and the other is five feet of elevation. Rutgers University assembled a scientific and technical advisory panel in 2016 and then again in 2019 to look at um, climate science issues and to establish some predicted sea level rise probabilities. The chart that you see up on the board is a summary of their work. And essentially what you see along the top of, of the table are the years 2030, 2050, all the way through 2150. And on the left side of the table, you'll see probabilities of exceedance. And these are probabilities that sea level will exceed a certain elevation by any of the years that are listed along the top of the table. For DEP's purposes, they looked at the year 2100 as the planning horizon, considering that structures and infrastructure, which are built over the next few years and decades, would conceivably still be in place and serviceable by the year 2100, 75 years into the future. Additionally, uh, they considered two different uh, elevation exceedances. So if you look at the column of the year 2100, uh, which is in brown, and that assumes moderate greenhouse emissions. And then at the yellow and red rows, what you'll see is this scientific uh, advisory panel concluded that there was a 50% chance that sea level rise would exceed 3.3 feet by the year 2100. And in the red row, a 17% chance that sea level rise would exceed 5.1 feet by the year 2100. And for the purposes of this rule, the EP in selecting uh, the year 2100 as the planning horizon also selected five feet of sea level rise as the uh, metric for updating uh, flood elevations as well as establishing a new uh, special area for regulation.
These regulations introduce what's called an inundation risk zone. And the inundation risk zone, abbreviated IRZ, is the predicted area of permanent standing water due to sea level rise by the year 2100. So in other words, taking our existing sea level and adding five feet to it and assuming that to be the new sea level, which is predicted um, in the rules and through this uh, advisory panel as a state of conditions in the year 2100. The rule also introduces an elevation to our existing FEMA flood hazard elevation, the 100-year the, the uh, flood zone, adding five feet to that as the climate adjusted flood elevation, that's abbreviated CAFE. And we'll get into the specifics of those two in just a minute. Um, but the CAFE is the predicted future limit of coastal flood uh, hazard areas, which are influenced by storm induced sea level rise, again, by the year 2100. When we compound these two concepts, the inundation risk zone, moving our sea level five feet, uh, and then adding five feet to the current FEMA zone, we can see this has a compounding effect, especially for structures that are located along any shoreline, not just the Atlantic shoreline or the Delaware Bay, but also along uh, tidal shorelines uh, of our river systems, which reach far into the state in a number of, uh, of municipalities, which we'll get into later in the presentation. So specifically, to the inundation risk zone. Um, what we see in this graphic, again, supplied by DEP, is a typical structure located along a shoreline with current sea level rise, uh, or current sea level depicted on the right, and where, that, uh, where the water meets the land, our current shoreline. When we add five feet to that to create the inundation risk zone, we see that that uh, shoreline moves horizontally inland depending on the topography. In locations in the state where there is relatively shallow topography, we could see that shoreline move significantly landward um, from the existing river systems and existing back bay, waters, oceans, et cetera. The inundation risk zone in, in the proposed rules is intended to regulate both residential development as well as critical buildings and critical infrastructure. Um, critical buildings and critical infrastructure would include uh, medical facilities, first responder facilities, um, schools, churches, areas which are expected to be habitable. Um, and in the construction or the proposed renovation of these facilities, the inundation risk zone new regulation will require a series of studies to be completed as part of that development process. Those will include an impact assessment to define the potential for impacts both on-site and off-site for the, for the location of where that structure will be built or whether that structure will need to be moved to a different portion of the property. In addition, an alternatives analysis will be required for the on-site development or rehabilitation. And that alternatives analysis uh, will have to consider different types of construction methodology, various locations for the facility, as well as a no-build alternative, as all alternative analysis are required to do. And the third component of that permitting will be a risk acknowledgement, whereby structures to be either developed or renovated in the inundation risk zone, which require permitting from the state, will have a condition of their permit, which necessitates a deed notice to be placed on the title for the property, informing current and future ownership that the property is anticipated to be inundated, and it will state essentially the depth of inundation expected uh, to be permanent standing water into the future. As you might imagine, this creates a rather significant impact. And uh, for the purposes of, of just illustrating the inundation risk zone, uh, I have two maps for you. One is of Cape May County. Uh, this is, uh, for the ease of presentation, Cape May County is laid over on its side. So the Delaware Bay is located at the north of this map and the Atlantic Ocean 
uh, I'm sorry, at the top of the map is the Delaware Bay, and at the bottom of the map is the Atlantic Ocean. And you'll see the areas indicated in blue are the new mapped inundation risk zone, uh, which in Cape May County covers 43% of the land mass. Um, this has a rather substantial and disproportionate impact on Cape May County, but also on other counties as well. Um, can skip to the next slide. We can see in Atlantic County, um, again, the area in blue is the inundation risk zone, and this uh, covers roughly 17% of Atlantic County, not just impacting the Barrow Island communities as one might expect, uh, but also following the river systems, both in Cape May and Atlantic County, well into what we would consider to be uh, mainland municipalities, uh, where that inundation risk zone carries uh, that expected five, five feet of sea level rise. We'll quickly move on now to the climate adjusted flood elevations, again, abbreviated CAFE. Um, and again, just, just to remind everyone, the CAFE is taking the current FEMA 100 year flood elevation and adding five feet to it. So utilizing a similar graphic to what we saw before, um, to the right, you'll see current sea level and then adding five feet to the current sea level is the inundation risk zone that's the future anticipated sea level as predicted uh, and, uh, and regulated by, by the proposed rules. And you'll also see on the right, the current 1% um, flood elevation or the 100 year flood elevation as mapped by FEMA. When we add five feet to that to achieve the climate adjusted flood elevation, we see the structures changes significantly and the finished floor elevation raises substantially. The EP has acknowledged that these rules are intended um, to address sea level in a manner that uh, discourages further development along the Barrow Islands and the low-lying uh, mainland areas uh, within these tidal flood hazard areas. And they also acknowledge that uh, there will be an intercept between tidal flood hazard areas and fluvial flood hazard areas where, um, where the climate adjusted flood elevation will prevail in these regulations and will require a finished floor elevation to be one foot above these flood elevations. I should also mention before we get into the mapping um, that this five foot of additional uh, flood elevation is based on the prevailing FEMA mapping at the time. As many of you are aware, FEMA is currently in the process of a restudy for New Jersey to reevaluate uh, their current flood maps. And they're in the process of conducting both still water analysis to establish static flood elevation. And then uh, late this winter and into the spring, FEMA expects to complete their wave modeling analysis, which will add the dynamic condition uh, to the static flood elevation. Based on our discussions with FEMA, we understand that just based on the still water elevation, we expect anywhere between a half a foot to one and a half feet of additional flood elevation to be reflected on the future FEMA mapping to be released in draft form uh, in the summer of 2025. And that could translate to as much as six to seven feet of change when compounded between the climate, the proposed climate adjusted flood elevation and the anticipated changes that would come out of uh, FEMA's coastal mapping process. We can uh, skip forward. I'm gonna run through a series of slides where we can see exactly what that elevation impact would be. So again, first looking at Cape May and Atlantic County, uh, we can see the areas in orange that are depicted, orange or yellowish color, are the current FEMA flood zones and the area in red are areas that will be added into uh, flood, flood zone regulation based on the CAFE mapping. Again, these elevations and, and uh, GIS files come out of DEP's uh, Office of uh, GIS, and they're intended to help visually understand the various impacts that the CAFE will have. 
So while we might just initially concentrate on those areas in red where new flood mapping will occur, we should also focus on the fact that the areas in orange, which are currently in the flood zone, and many of those structures exist and, and, uh, and have gone through a rehabilitation process to adjust to climate change and, and sea level rise, some structures as a result of Superstorm Sandy, which went through a renovation process to bring their finished floor elevations to one foot above the BFE or the FEMA mapped flood elevation. Those communities will also experience an additional five feet of, uh, of flood elevation rise. So structures which were brought to current FEMA standards, which if they adjust the height of that structure, the finished, um, the finished footprint, where they add additional habitable area to those structures, will have to go through a permitting process, um, which will bring them, force them to go into compliance and bring their finished floor elevation to one foot above the climate adjusted flood elevation. So again, we see Cape May County here and we can move forward to Atlantic County. And it's important to consider that these impacts are not just to what we consider to be the coastal zone or the coastal communities of New Jersey. We also took the liberty of looking into some of the uh, major cities in New Jersey and did mapping for those as well. We lead off with Hoboken and Hudson County. Again, what you see in uh, the orangey yellow are existing uh, flood hazard areas, which will experience, again, a five foot adjustment to that flood elevation, as well as new areas depicted in red. Uh, Hoboken will now, after uh, the proposed rules, Hoboken will end up with about 89% of its land mass in a flood hazard area, which represents a 16% increase over uh, those currently mapped areas in the city. Next, we look at Jersey City. After these rules, Jersey City ends up with 55% of its land mass in a flood hazard area. That's an increase of 15%. And we looked at what the relative impact would be to some of the residential neighborhoods in Jersey City, uh, which have an existing elevation of seven to eight feet and are currently in an, an 11 foot uh, FEMA flood zone. With the addition of the CAFE rules, that would, that would change the flood elevation from 11 feet to 16 feet. And based on a seven to eight foot ground elevation, that would be an increase of eight to nine feet of additional separation to achieve the finished floor elevation, which I think speaks specifically to Commissioner Barr's concerns about accessibility into these structures, given such a great disparity between existing ground elevation and what the future finished floor elevation would require. Moving on, and uh, next we have uh, the city of Newark, which experiences 43% uh, of its land mass ending up in a flood hazard uh, area, which is an increase of about 13 and a half percent, including um, portions of, uh, of the city, not just along uh, the, river, uh, the, the river system, but also in some of the back bay waters and bays, and um, also encroaching into the Newark airport. Next, we move on uh, just to the south to Elizabeth, which is uh, ends up with about 23% of its land mass in a flood hazard area and an increase of 18%. You can see uh, the residential neighborhoods along the rivers of the Elizabeth River system that fall into that newly established flood hazard elevation. Moving south along the coast, we look at Long Branch, which ends up with 49% of the municipality in a flood hazard area, which is an increase of 33% over what it uh, currently has adapted. Asbury Park 
ends up with half of its land mass in a flood elevation, an increase of 22.5%. Much of it concentrated into residential neighborhoods. Moving further south along the coast to Point Pleasant and Point Pleasant Beach. Point Pleasant with 68.5% in a flood hazard area, an increase of 36.5%. And Point Pleasant Beach with 97% of its municipality in a flood hazard area, an increase of 28%. Next, we look at uh, Tom's River with 25.5% of the municipality in a flood hazard area, an increase of 6%. And jumping across the state to look at cities along the Delaware River, the city of Camden ends up with 50% of the city in a flood hazard area. This is an increase of 22.5%. Uh, Just as we did in Jersey City, we looked at some of the residential neighborhoods in uh, Camden, which have a ground elevation ranging anywhere between six to nine feet um, based on a current flood elevation of uh, FEMA, FEMA elevation of 10, which would change to 15, which would result in anywhere between seven to 10 feet of elevation change between the existing ground elevation and the future required finished floor elevation. These neighborhoods in Camden typically consist of single family um, units or row homes, uh, which are currently built to one, uh, about one to two feet above grade and are not currently compliant with flood hazard elevations. But in going through any kind of substantial improvement that would then trigger, um, trigger permitting with DEP, these structures would be required the habitable areas would be required to be brought uh, to compliance with a 15 foot flood elevation and a finished floor again, substantially higher than the current ground elevation. And then lastly, moving on to Salem City, where we see 78 and a half percent of Salem City in a flood hazard area and an increase of 38%, a substantial increase in new areas added into uh, flood regulation. As I mentioned earlier, there is a, uh, a litany of other regulations that are included in these proposed rules. They stretch across the, the state in terms of stormwater management, in terms of uh, flood hazard regulation, freshwater wetlands regulation, but again, for the purposes of this discussion and the interest of, of some of the other presenters, I think I'll stop here um, and we can move on and understand some of the impacts that occur from these proposed rules statewide. So, Ron Simone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, I also want to reiterate uh, my colleague, Commissioner Barr's sentiments and thanking the New Jersey Association of Counties for hosting this workshop. And uh, thank you to all attendees for your time and for listening to our presentation regarding the potential impacts of NJDP's proposed real rules on local and county governments. Uh, today's discussion on the New Jersey's proposed protection against climate threats, resilient environments, and landscapes rules uh, is critical, especially as we consider the potential impact on municipal and county governments across the state. The focus is on ensuring a thoughtful, measured approach to protect our environment while acknowledging the wide-ranging effects on local governance, housing, infrastructure, and the local and statewide economy. Cape May County has been engaged with uh, floodplain managers and construction officials, as well as municipal and county officials across the state uh, to hear their concerns uh, regarding the impacts of the proposed rules, uh, which I'll be diving into uh, momentarily. Uh, so the NJ PAC real rules arise from an undeniable need to address the evolving challenges posed by climate change, sea level rise, and coastal storms. The coastal zones of New Jersey face documented risk from these threats, and indeed thoughtful action at every level of government is crucial. However, the sweeping nature of these new regulatory frameworks brings complex implications that necessitate a carefully calibrated 
incremental approach with diverse stakeholder engagement in advance of implementation. Cape May County, like many other counties in New Jersey, is highly vulnerable to climate change, particularly sea level rise and coastal flooding. In Cape May County, we are no strangers to the risk posed by coastal storms, and like most coastal and riverine communities across the state, we continue to implement effective coastal resiliency measures to protect infrastructure, life, and properties. Our municipalities have proactively aligned with FEMA and state floodplain management standards, engaged in the ISO's community rating system with some of Cape May County's municipalities already having not only the most stringent building payment standards in the state, but in the country, as reiterated, um, as I reiterate from Commissioner Barr's statements earlier. However, under the real rule proposal, municipalities in New Jersey's flood hazard areas are now asked to redefine their floodplain management practices in alignment with the projections for the year 2100. The science from Rutgers University, which Peter has dove into already, underpins this approach, forecasted at 17% probability of sea level rising beyond five feet by the end of this century. The foresight drives regulations that demand substantial changes to our infrastructure and residential developments, mandating heightened flood elevations and stringent building standards. For counties like Cape May, where over 42% of land is projected to fall within the expanded inundation risk zones, these rules are transformative. Municipalities within these zones are mandated to assess and mitigate against flood risk, but the economic toll on local governments and residents could be staggering. Regulatory, requ regulatory requirements will entail higher construction standards for new roads, which will likely include elevating roads by five feet above base flood elevation. Such modifications not only present technical feasibility issues, but also bring significant financial strain on municipal and county budgets already stretched thin. Densely populated areas such as Hoboken, Jersey City, Newark, and Camden, as highlighted by Mr. Lomax in his map showing the climate adjusted flood elevations, otherwise known as CAFE, face similar burdens. With densely populated residential zones now placed within the new flood hazard areas, property owners may face increased construction costs and stricter rebuilding requirements. The rules would also enforce a 3% impervious coverage limit within the inundation risk zone, impacting municipal for affordable housing obligations, a crucial issue given New Jersey's recent shift in affordable housing policy this past March that includes the abolishment of COA. Is the impacts on working class families that make stakeholder engagement and formal notification to impacted property owners so important? Important. If a planning board application is applied, is filed for a variance or new construction at the local level, all property owners within 200 feet are notified in accordance with local and state standards. Similarly, we believe impacted property owners within the state's newly proposed CAFE and IRZ zones deserve formal notification and public engagement for them to better understand the impacts these new map overlays will have on them their, and their properties in advance of implementation of the new proposed real rules. The planning horizon specified by NJDP spanning over a 75 year trajectory is another area where municipalities and concerned public officials are advocating for a more moderate approach. Currently, municipal master plans operate within a 10-year window, a time scale that aligns more closely with actionable predictions and manageable adjustments. Counties and municipalities throughout the state are strongly urging the state to consider a more gradual, adaptable framework that aligns with these shorter planning periods, allowing for adjustments as scientific understanding and predictive models evolve. Under these new real rules, local government offices, particularly construction and code enforcement departments, will shoulder new responsibilities to ensure compliance with these heightened standards, particularly from an enforcement perspective, trying to track work outside the scope of the Uniform Construction Code for the purposes of calculating the state's newly proposed definition of substantial improvement that will include work outside the scope of the Uniform Construction Code. To meet these obligations, additional personnel or contractual support may be necessary, further impacting municipal budgets. For reasons of additional financial burden on local governments that a dedicated state funding allocation or grant program to support towns as they implement these rules is so important, as without it, it risks leaving municipalities and counties financially strained while undertaking these significant projects and new regulatory standards. Furthermore, these stringent regulations jeopardize the viability of key public infrastructure projects. For example, 
the Ocean Drive Bridge Reconstruction Project in Cape May that we are currently working on design uh, faces feasibility challenges with the mandated elevation increases. For coastal municipalities where tourism is a vital economic driver, the long-term impacts of these limitations on infrastructure cannot be overstated. The, econo the economic impact may further extend beyond government budgets, directly affecting property owners within newly defined flood hazard zones. In Cape May County alone, an area with over $50 billion in net rateables, over $635 million in annual, annual state tourism tax revenues, and over $7 billion in direct tourism spending, these expanded regulations pose an unknown and unstudied threat to our economy and way of life. Given that municipalities are already grappling with the housing crisis driven by affordability challenges, these new rules could further exacerbate the issue as families on fixed incomes struggle to keep up with the rising costs associated with mandated upgrades. A full-scale economic analysis would provide municipalities with insights into the true costs, allowing for informed decisions, making and resources, informed decision making and resources, resource allocation. That is why stakeholders across New Jersey are encouraging the state to consider their this prudent approach ensuring the burden of regulatory compliance does not disproportionately impact low and middle income families. There is also the critical issue of historic preservation uh, that was specifically brought up by our city of Cape May, which the entire city is uh, a historic district. Cape May County is home to a wealth of um, several historic districts and historic buildings um, with cultural heritage that holds significant value for our state. The new building standards put forth by the NJDP would place these at areas at risk with limited provisions for preserving the architectural integrity of our historic structures. Ensuring that these rules account for their unique needs of historic sites statewide is crucial to retaining the character and heritage that makes New Jersey historic districts and properties so unique and economically valuable. Cape May County, along with numerous other stakeholders, strongly advocates for a legislative approach that allows for robust public discourse. Additionally, it is crucial for the state to wait for the FEMA um, to release the updated firms, the flood insurance rate maps, as Peter had indicated before, ensuring consistency in public policy between state and federal standards. Um, you know, as Peter had dove into FEMA's forthcoming updates uh, to the firms, um, which are anticipated to be released sometime next summer, uh, we'll consider new still water and wave calculations that will increase the complexity of this issue as the likely new increases in height requirements established by FEMA will be count compounded against the state's new height requirements. These updated maps are essential tools for guiding public policy Yet the real rules proposed to expand flood hazard areas ahead of these updates, which may result in regulations that do not align with FEMA's final determinations. Our ask to the state is straightforward. Let's work collaboratively to implement these changes in a manner that empowers municipalities and county governments rather than overwhelms them. A phased implementation grounded in transparent science and informed public input will allow municipalities to adapt their infrastructure, protect their economies, and ultimately foster resilient, sustainable communities. We are not climate deniers. We understand the importance of addressing climate change and municipal and county governments who have taken a formal position on this topic want to be a part of the solution. That is why we are urging the state to adopt a balanced, adaptable approach with widespread public engagement that prioritizes transparent, evidence-based policy development and to strive to safeguard the financial and social fabrics of our communities. Together, we can chart a course toward climate resilience that respects the unique needs of our communities, preserving our historic cultural heritage, and upholding the quality of life for all New Jersey residents. Uh, without further ado, and with that said, uh, I will kick it over to our County Council, um, Jeff Lynn, to discuss legal implications specific to the rules and a closing statement on behalf of the county. Thank so, you, Ron. As uh, Commissioner Barr indicated in his opening, um, and Ron touched upon just a minute ago, in July, Ron, if you can go to the next slide, I don't have access. In, in July, the, the Cape May County Board of County Commissioners adopted Resolution 421-24, requesting that the state conduct a comprehensive and independent analysis of the potential economic and social impacts of the proposed regulations, with a focus on protecting the interests of low and moderate income families. To engage the legislature and enact these rules through the typical legislative process, that the regulations be based on a 20 or 30 year time frame that is adjusted over time to reflect sea level rise and resiliency measures rather than based on the 80 year projection. 
to the inclusion of a, a budgetary appropriation to assist towns with the implementation of these rules, as well as funding to implement a state grant program to support coastal resiliency projects. And um, as was indicated by Pete and Ron, uh, to wait until FEMA has issued their maps and to prepare detailed flood maps and hold further public engagement sessions across the state before any rules are adopted. So for the past several months, Cape May County has been raising awareness about the rule. Our view has been that the more our elected officials and residents realize the scope of the rule and how it impacts them, the better chance we have gaining consensus on legislation that addresses climate change with a thoughtful and measured approach. We've been seeking to gain a broad consensus of state, county, and local elected officials to join in these requests during the public comment period, which expires on November 7th. Once the, new, the public comment period expires, the DEP can adopt the, the proposed rule as is, or it can change them without the need to go back out for further additional public comment. The rule then becomes effective once it's published in the New Jersey Register. Ron, if you can go to the, the next slide. After the rules are published, it's then transferred to the legislature, which may review the rule for compliance with the agency's delegated authority and go overturn the rule if it exceeds that delegated authority. And you have here on the slide the, um, the Constitution. And under this amendment, if the legislature finds that the, quote, existing or proposed rule or regulation is not consistent with legislative intent, it may invalidate that rule or regulation or prevent it from taking effect, end quote. Next slide, Ron. If the legislature does not intervene, it can be challenged by an interested party on appeal to the appellate division. An interested party is not uh, really a bright line rule, and it's determined to be, quote, a party that has sufficient stake in the outcome of the matter and real adverseness to challenge, end quote. And just to be clear, the county is not advocating for a, a legal challenge to the rule. Our goal is not to be an adversary. Rather, our goal is to be a stakeholder with uh, partners with the DEP and others to make this rule meaningful and responsive. However, there are certain questions that should be asked about the rule. Ron, if you can go to the next slide. No, sorry, I go back. There you go. So there are certain questions we should be asking about the rule. Does the rule create risk for public for play? places of public accommodation within your communities to be out of compliance with the accessibility provisions of the American with Disabilities Act? Is the manner with which the rule was initiated with, within the appropriate constitutional scope? Is the rule consistent with the numerous statutes cited in the proposed rules authority? And is it promulgated based upon supported data? So going back to the first question regarding accessibility and being compliant with the American with Disabilities Act. Going back to one of the, the diagrams that was on Pete's slide, diagram five, um, it showed that the house being elevated above uh, where it needs to be. So I, I think Pete, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that increase is approximately 10 steps on a flight of stairs. Is that right, Pete? At least. At least. So it, it, to picture in your mind a flight of uh, stairs with 10 steps, that's approximately the increase that um, a, a place will need to be increased after these rules are adopted. Now, take um, one of your local favorite restaurants on a, a city block. Um, th they decide they want to do renovations. That triggers the substantial renovation under the rule. They now need to elevate their restaurant above that line. They also need to make it accessible for individuals with disabilities. So for them to be able to build a ramp that goes up as high as that house was elevated, Ramps are required to have a certain slope and at a certain distance have landings. There's many restaurants that are not going to be able to fit a, a, um, a ramp like that onto their properties. And this is not as simple as, okay, well, we'll add more money and, and have an elevator that, that'll, that'll um, satisfy that or that'll cure that issue. Um, elevators are not allowed to descend into flood water. So elevators at the bottom level need to be above the, the flood base elevation line. Um, so again, it can't descend into water. It needs to be above that flood base elevation line. So you're still going to need a ramp that gets up above the flood base elevation line to get to that elevator. Needless to say, it's going to create headaches for places of public accommodation that are triggered either by the substantial improvement or new development. 
Next, next slide, Ron. The, the second question is, is the manner with which the rule was initiated within the appropriate constitutional scope? So on January 20th, Governor Murphy issued Executive Order 100. And that, that directed, among other things, the DEP to, to adopt the PACT regulations and to identify DEP, DEP regulations to update, to integrate climate change considerations. On that next slide, Ron. On that very same day, then DEP Commissioner Catherine McCabe issued Administrative Order 2020 that relied upon Executive Order 100 directing the DEP to propose regulations consistent with that executive order. So this brings, next slide, Ron. This brings up the issue of separation of powers. You know, our constitutional powers are distributed among the three branches of government, the governor, the legislator, the judiciary. Our case law has long recognized that the branches of state government are not watertight compartments, but rather they aim, the aim is the separation of powers option is not to prevent such cooperative action, but to guarantee a system in which one branch cannot usurp the powers of another. Executive orders are obviously an accepted tool of the governor, but when they're issued with the appropriate constitutional scope. An executive order is invalid if it usurps the legislative authority by acting contrary to the express or implied will of the legislature. Next slide, Ron. Is the rule consistent with numerous statutes cited in the proposed rule as authority? Each proposed rule cites multiple statutes as, as authority, so comparing the proposed rule to legislative policy is necessary. There are certainly some that you'd want to focus on more than others. And then is the rule promulgated based on supported data? Ron, uh, okay. okay. Nope, go back, Ron, sorry. So the DEP bases its draft rule upon a report predicted sea level rise in the year 2100. The draft rule summary in a section entitled Sea Level Rise in New Jersey, it's on page seven, states that in 2019, the New Jersey Science and Technical Advisory Panel report predicted a range of sea level rise in the year 2100, ranging from 1.3 feet on the low end to 6.3 feet on the high end. That's at page eight. The DEP chose a conservative predicted sea level rise of five feet by the year 2100. However, studies from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Army Corps of Engineers, UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change all anticipate a significantly less sea level rise by the year 2100. Promulgating a rule based on unrealistic data would render the draft rule unreasonable. And again, we're, we're, we're not suggesting a legal challenge to these. Our approach is, is quite the opposite. We're looking to partner with the DEP and others to develop an approach that is reasonable and responsible for our local government and our residents. And I don't know, was um, Ron, were you going to do a closing? Was Commissioner Barr? Yeah, um, I mean, Commissioner Barr, do you want to yeah, close the statement on behalf of the county? I mean, that, that concludes our formal presentation. Again, I want to thank everybody for listening in today. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank you all for taking the time. Time is valuable and time is funny. I appreciate it. So, John, I don't know if you want to open it up to questions or what you want to do, but the floor is over to you. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. I, I appreciate it a great deal. It was very informative. Uh, are there any questions? If so, please put them in the in the Q and A. Um, while you're thinking about that, I will tell you that a video recording of this presentation will be made available as long as the folks from Cape May County are okay with this on our website. We'll also make sure to share it with everyone who participate in today's event, uh, and we'll also uh, make sure to share the PowerPoint presentation again, provided it's okay with the folks from Cape May County. And then lastly, I, I would definitely encourage you to visit, if you haven't done so already, uh, the county's website. Um, and if someone from the county, if you don't mind, if you could put it in the uh, in the Q&A, that would be great. Uh, we'll also make sure to send that test out along to our members, which we've done on a number of occasions, as it includes uh, the material that Mr. Lomax uh, presented throughout the presentation, which includes the maps. Um, and again, I think just provides a, a great overview of the challenges that the 
uh, counties across the state are are are, are facing. Um, and I am. Your speaker's not working. Please check your connection. You need so, so it here. doesn't look like we have any any questions. I do want to thank you again. I will ask you before you wait. We do great job. This is Ray Cantor from NJBIA. Um, who is he? He put and Ron Simone put the uh, yeah. link to the county's website on the uh, in the Q and A. So make sure to to check that out. I think it's important. Um, and and I'll have some follow up questions for you uh, after after this video presentation. So uh, again, want to thank you for, yeah, for everyone for being here, and especially thank Cape May County for taking the time out of your out of your busy schedule so, uh, to be here today. So with that, have a uh, have a great day, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks again, John. Great, thank you.